Do we, need, do we need more mics or two enough? Two is so I think so. Whoever. Good afternoon, everybody, and a big namaste because. This is a very special session today. Uh, Rupa is very excited about it because this really is all about the India agenda for Equality Moonshot. And for many of you who've been at Davos, you may have seen the India Lounge, the Maharashtra Lounge, the free chai from Tata's. So India is really making headlines here at Davos. It's been called the India Decade, and we are all rooting for that. But I think it's such an important time when we make global headlines. What's really important is to remember that how are we making sure that the foundation is one built on equality and built on one which includes Indian women. So we have a panel here of amazing Indian women from different fields in different parts of the world. But as I said, they always take a bit of India with them. And uh, just uh, to point out, I mean, I, I, when I was invited for the session, some great news came at home that India's maternal mortality rates have actually dropped for the first time in decades. So that's a huge achievement. And I think that's <laughs> the kind of big achievement that the government of India, the women of India are really, really working on. And I think if we look at that, that when we look at the India story today, let's not look at one which is of doom and gloom. Let's look at one which is of dreams, which is of possibilities, and which is of moonshots. Because really what happens to Indian women today is impacting the world, because the other headline, of course, is that we're going to be the most populous country in the world by this year. So that's the big focus we want to look at. Some of the areas that I thought we could touch on, because we've got such a wide-ranging uh, panel and different perspectives here, is the impact of COVID. Why is it that it has impacted uh, women disproportionately across the world, and especially in India? Why is it that even though Indian women are topping classes, that when it's an equal playing field, they're beating the boys in engineering, in all STEM subjects, which are traditionally areas they weren't there. They're topping. But then within five to 10 years, where do the Indian women go when it comes to leadership positions? Where do they go when it comes to boardrooms? These women don't become invisible. They're there. It's just that we don't see them. And I think this is the time for all of us to look at how do we bring them back center stage. In India, the lovely thing is that women are worshipped as goddesses. We're Durga Ma, we're Shakti, we're Lakshmi. But we don't want to be on a pedestal. We want to be there taking our space at the global high table. India's leading the G20 presidency. And what better way to lead than by putting our women center stage. So just with that, I'd like to introduce you to my absolutely uh, fantastic panel this afternoon. I'm joined by Mirai uh, Chatterjee of uh, Seva. Now, this is the Self-Employed Women's Association. But for those of you who don't know it, it is a social revolution in India. I mean, the millions of women's lives they touch have changed families, have changed generations. I'm also joined by Anita Bhatia. She's executive director at uh, UN Women, and we all know the fantastic work being uh, done by uh, UN Women. And uh, also with me is uh, Divya Gokulnath. Now she's the young co-founder of Baiju, which is now one of the world's most prominent ed tech companies and launching major social initiatives to make sure young girls are being impacted uh, by education. I'm also joined by Reshma Ramachandran. She's board member and also somebody who's worked on the agenda for this uh, foundation, this conference. So welcome, Reshma. I'm also joined uh, by Seema of uh, Cure, working in healthcare, changing women's lives through healthcare, and Navroop Sehdev of The Digital Economist, the CEO. So what an amazing panel here. Let's get a big round of applause for all of them. 
And I'm uh, Sonia Singh. I'm editorial director with New Delhi Television, which is uh, India's, I, I'm saying, leading national news network. And I'm happy to say the first television editor in chief is a woman. So I'm thrilled with that as well. So, kind of thing it is. Uh, so Meera Chatterjee, let me begin with you, because I think just the story of Seva and the, how beginning with a small group of women, it became something which impacted millions of lives. What's the learning we get from there? We look now at 2023, a new year, a new in India decade. How do we take it forward? Thanks, Sonia. Thanks, Sonia, and wonderful to be here with my sisters from different fields. I think what we've learned in the last 50 years of the Seva movement is that women in our country are our biggest asset. You ask about opportunities. What better opportunity than half the citizens of our country who in my last 40 years of experience are resourceful, talented, insightful, and an also an economic powerhouse, both in unpaid and paid work. Um, so I think if there's one thing we've learned is that there is a lot of inspiration. Certainly I have been inspired. My life has been transformed working shoulder to shoulder with these women who have so little. All they want is security of work and income, food security and social security. Um, and basic self-reliance, women's economic empowerment, and I think they've shown the way. And the way they've shown it is across caste, class, religious, ethnic identity, we have built the sisterhood. There's still a long way to go, but we are 2.1 million across 18 states of India. And, and, and I think, uh, I don't know, that many people may not know that in India, many of our welfare schemes actually now go to the woman head of the household because the belief is that if you give it to the man, you may educate the man, but if you give it to the woman, you educate the family, and that goes down generations. So I think that's something, Anita, I mean, the, the kind of India message, whether it's been welfare models, whether it's been social models, has been very different from those of the rest of the world. How does the UN, and how do you see your work at the UN looking at those opportunities and challenges for India? Look, first and foremost, I would say is that the UN's job is global. So we look at universal data, and I think what happens a lot when you are looking globally is that in-country and cross-country variations tend to get lost. So one of the big messages that I have is that we need to do a much better job in disseminating what works in the global south, and particularly in India, because it is such a wonderful laboratory of innovation and things that work at scale. Because it's easy in development to find interventions that work for a small group. But what is much harder to find is things that are scalable. And so India's gift to the world, if you will, is scalability and replicability. But we are not doing a good job. And by we, I mean the collective we, uh, of those of us who work in development, but also I think there is an affirmative responsibility now as part of the G20 presidency for India to take those stories of success of what has worked and share it with the world because everybody is hungry to learn about what works. I was on a panel this morning with my dear friend, Minister Smriti Rani, and a couple of other people, and there was this wonderful story of women being involved in distributed energy a story that was clearly based on an understanding at a systemic level of what's not working, of interventions that address the entire system and not just one aspect of the problem. And the illustration was of something that addressed women, climate, um, you know, access to economic opportunity, uh, empowerment, leadership. It was a wonderful story. Absolutely. Is it known outside? Not at all. And, you know, the thing is, because so much of dialogue and discourse in development is still dominated by those who pay, right? The big aid givers in the world are the ones who are driving the narrative. So there's a huge need to change the narrative. Just one sh small story to illustrate. This is the first Davos, which is in person of this size, uh, you know, in the BC world, right, before COVID. 2019, uh, UN Women co-hosted a leadership breakfast. And we invited the woman who was j had just been named at that time the first CEO on Wall Street, uh, Jane Fraser of Citibank. And, you know, I remember saying to Jane, congratulations, 
But, you know, and she said, you know, um, it's great. We, you know, we talked a little bit about this. The truth is, at that time, there were a number of women who were CEOs in banks in India. So I was like, you know, what is the, this is such a big deal on Wall Street that you have a female CEO, when we in India have, have, have had female CEOs in banks for a long time. So these stories need to get out. And we are not good at it. Absolutely, and of course, to point out that the first women prime ministers came from South Asia, and America doesn't have a woman president yet. <laughs> so we'll, we'll wait for them to catch up. But uh, I just wanted to bring in also uh, Divya Gokulnath uh, here, because uh, Divya, really the perspective from education, and that has really been something which has liberated so many young girls. I was just talking about the results that show where the IITs now have 20% of women coming in in their classes. Why do you think education is seen as the way out for so many young girls from what may be a social circumstance, an economic, or even a ethnic uh, circumstance or a caste circumstance to liberate them? You know, education is actually the strongest bedrock for a secure future and a passport to freedom, right? That's what I've seen. It has been for so many young women, and, and I'm seeing that through so many initiatives that we've launched. Uh, so we have 5.5 million children across India who are learning on our platform for free. Half of them are girls, not by design, but by choice, right? This means that where you can't get the girls to school, you can take the school to the girls. And that's important because when the, there is no threat of uh, security, uh, there, are, there are no other challenges. Because when in an online world, and just to give context, what we have is online and hybrid learning programs for, for uh, boys and girls and from 3 to 40. So we are seeing a huge uptake, equal uptake, from women for these new ways of learning. And it's really helping them. And speaking about the pandemic, Sonia, and I think that's it's changed a lot of things for us, uh, for us women. Because if and I was thinking, what is that biggest thing which will help us, uh, enable us? It's flexibility, right? We all want a flexibility because we want to be able to choose how we want to work, when we want to work. We want our mind to be free. We want to be decluttered so that we can take strong and impactful decisions. We have been asking for flexibility forever, but now since the entire world wants work from home to be a reality, we finally get it. We talk about words like moonlighting, right? But we, and I can speak for Indian women, have been moonlighting forever from home with small uh, sewing shops, or with small uh, tuition center. Tuition is after school tutoring. We've been doing it. And one last thing is, look at what it's done for education. So education, especially, has liberated a lot of stakeholders, uh, both te all teachers, students, parents, institutions. And just to give you an example, we have created 20,000 teaching jobs for women over the last 18 months, where they're teaching from home to the rest of the world. So we're able to create a revolution in a job which is highly respectable, hugely impactful. And their terms, I think that's really important. I'm going to just come back to Mirai before, because Mirai has to leave a little bit early. But Mirai, just at that point, on when we look ahead, what's an action agenda you'd like to see to policymakers? And uh, I think, as Anita said, global policymakers, not just for India, for women to actually be able to negotiate life on their own terms and aim for the moon. Sure. As I said, women are very economically active. I think we need to remember, and perhaps this audience doesn't know, that more than 94% of India's women are in the informal economy. Uh, they are active, they are contributing more than 50% to India's GDP, and what they need is an enabling environment. They need, uh, one of the things we've been saying to our Honorable Finance Minister is that we need a fund for women's collective enterprises, a fund that's easily navigable. Uh, even though there has been progress with financial inclusion, it's very difficult for poor women to access loans and on favorable terms from the banks. So easy access to finance, working capital, so they can build up their businesses. Um, and these are tiny nano businesses, but they uh, are bottom up, you know, strengthening the local economy and therefore our national economy. And then an enabling environment from the point of view of social protection and a recognition of their care work, particularly during the pandemic. Women have not been able to go back to work. 85% of the women in one study uh, that we conducted said that their menfolk could go back to work, but they couldn't. 
Because who would take care of the children, the elderly, the anganwadis, the childcare centers were shut. So I think a recognition of the care economy, investing more, both the government and the private sector, in care services infrastructure, which will enable more women to go into the workforce. And you know, we've talked a lot of, uh, of the positive side, but unfortunately, our female workforce participation rate is definitely not up to scratch. We can do much more. And with this kind of enabling environment, a combination of livelihood security, financial services, it has to be a holistic integrated approach and social protection. We've done a lot, we've got to do a lot more. And also bridging the digital divide. As other sisters have said, you know, there is much greater progress during the pandemic, but we still have a way to go. Thank you, Nidal. Thanks so much uh, for being here. So just that, I mean, I think exactly the point made that we have to recognize that doing uh, good for women is not a favor, it's something which benefits a country. We contribute to the GDP, we've earned that right, and it makes just good sense. It makes good uh, social sense, political sense, and investing in your nation and the world's future. So, Reshma, I'd like to bring you in on that, because especially with Indian women, we've heard uh, that we progress uh, so well when it comes to education, et cetera, but we hit, I mean, I don't know whether I should call it a ceiling or just a brick wall, mid-career, even when you realize you, you go in there with dreams, but about within five years down, you're like, I have to, I have to sacrifice, I have to give it up. And I think all Indian women on the panel know that somehow it's expected of them. It's kind of almost in the build they uh, drink when they are born. Why is that? And what, how would you, as your lessons, as somebody who's actually in the corporate world, uh, talk about that? Yeah, I think it's a very, very personal question in that sense, uh, Sonia. And I, I, I personally think, you know, India is a paradox in that sense. And especially when, I, when we look at India creating the headline for the next decade, it's a largest growing economy. Uh, you know, India is actually, and rightly as you said, taking the center stage. Yet it's actually tangled in a lot of social complexities. And this is where women, I feel, feel victim, me personally as well. I went to one of the best universities in India, IIT, and as I Everybody who is Indian knows how hard it is to get into IIT. And as you rightly said, you know, uh, as soon as I had my first child, there was all these social expectations on me to quit my job. And I succumbed to those social expectations, partly to the social expectations, partly my social conditioning that mother is a primary caregiver, I quit my job. And I was at the peak of my career. And the only thing that I'm really grateful for is to have a wonderful spouse who actually encouraged me to get back to uh, the corporate workforce. And three years, when my son was three years, I got back into the workforce. And I'm here uh, on the board of Fortune 500 companies. I'm a corporate executive. Uh, I've lived in 13 countries, Switzerland being my home now, thanks to my spouse. And you know what I truly, truly believe in is social change cannot happen only by organizations having an agenda or a nation having an agenda or putting in money into it. And some, some one of one of us actually said that you know we always talk about money, but social change actually comes from us. Families, families are where first social change happens. Societies second. And third comes organizations. Organizations are always a reflection of societies. And if there is a social conditioning, and as I said, you know, being a very well-educated woman who is ambitious, who wanted to pursue a, uh, uh, her executive career, if I left my job, think about those who are not as privileged. The social conditioning just sucks you into that. So for me personally, I would say, you know, having lived in different countries as well, the more I actually get into the uh, root cause of it, it comes down to the social conditioning. And for me, that social conditioning can only change with change in ourselves. And again, I, 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 I want to thank my husband for this. I am here, sitting here in this panel, because he did not accept a social norm. You know, I just want to just applaud you for calling this point out because this issue of norms, attitudes, mindsets, and behaviors is like the fundamental stumbling block. And I have to say something uncomfortable, which is that women are often the carriers of those attitudes themselves. This is not just a male issue. It is the women who actually have the opportunity to change those mindsets in the way they raise children, the way they see occupational segregation, the way they stereotype roles till today. You know, there are women who consider themselves very strong feminists, Indian friends of mine, 
we have to check ourselves. Because if you have young children, you have a girl child and a boy child. You have guests. Who do you look at first when you say, Acha beta, bring me a glass of water for the guest? Do you look at the girl child? Do you look at the boy child? This is where it starts. So you are so right about this starting in the family unit and about changing our mindsets. Sorry, I just needed to say that because it's uncomfortable to say that women have to change themselves. No, I, I agree. In fact, just taking a point from what Reshma said, I mean, I've got three children and, you know, being a 24-7 news person with three kids, you need a husband, you need a mother-in-law, you need a mother, you need a village to make sure that women can actually go out and work with kids. But I think the point is, the more women do it, the more you have women role models, the more you'll see that people think this is normal, this is not out of the ordinary, that the husband can take a back seat at some time or babysit if you're out on an assignment and something. And I think that that's really something which I'm glad to say is changing and uh, yeah. I'd, I'd so love Before you just, yeah. so it's basically in one line, women can take care and take charge and men can take charge and take <laughs> care. <right>? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Seema, come in, uh, come in on that because of course your experience has also been so fascinating in terms of the work you're doing in healthcare, the terms of the work you're doing in a corporate world. How do you see all this balancing when you're looking at young, what would you tell a young woman today that these are the mistakes you must not make but this is what you need to get out there and grab? Uh, no, I think the, 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 the real change will come from the next generation, I believe. And uh, back to the social norms, you know, I think that it was mentioned in the abstract and the Pew Research did this, you know, phenomenal piece of work, study, in which it showed that actually, you know, despite all of the progress that's been made, men actually believe that they still are the head of the household and they somehow have a little bit more of a dominant um, role, even though they believed in equal, uh, you know, gender parity and all of that, they still believe that they just had that slight edge in being the head of the household. But what was what was most fascinating was all the Indian women who were surveyed also believed the same thing: that despite being equal uh, members of society, that the head of the household was the man. And so as I think about it, I'm, I'm from the diaspora. I left India almost 35 years ago, and I watch India and its progress from afar. Um, lot, a lot of it with pride, because I think that the incredible progress that's been made against a what remains still a patriarchal society, I think is just um, phenomenal. And I think that's because women have been agents of change. And that's, you know, so we do need to take credit for that. And if I think back, we're, sp uh, we're, we're uh, celebrating Azadi Ki Amrit Mahotsav, that is uh, 75 years of India's independence. And, and as I look at it, I think about three areas where we've made progress. One is in life expectancy. So women in 1947 only lived until they were 30 years old. And now, you know, we live up to 70 years old. Second is in literacy. 6% of women were literate in 1947. It's now up to about 66% or so. And then finally in labor participation, you know, a lot of increased labor participation. But it's a tale of two cities. Best of times, but worst of times. Because guess what? Despite life expectancy being so high, you live up to 70. But guess what? Your quality of life is not great. Because you still bear the triple burden of taking care of your family, the household chores, and, and everything else. So quality of life, and again, it comes back to the, to the norms. Second is literacy has increased, but health literacy and sexual literacy, reproductive rights literacy, that still we need to make a lot of progress. And finally, labor participation, I think as you mentioned, for the last decade or so, it's just hovered at the same level and why? Because workplace safety, um, you know, not having the care infrastructure has made us, uh, you know, not that. But last point I wanna make is, this is an extraordinary phenomenon that I observe every day in my life. Um, first of all, I am a CEO, but most people uh, will not introduce me as a CEO because there's some discomfort, you know, associating the words chief executive officer with a woman. I'm like, hello, uh, that's number one. Number two, you know, um, one of the most popular shows on Netflix is Indian Matchmaking. I don't know how many people have seen it, okay? And every quote-unquote Indian party I go to in the United States, there's talk about that. And then in meeting some of the actual women who are part of that show, you see what stigma it is to be single and not be married. And so in the Indian diaspora, 
women are still carrying and actually the older, older norms. And while India has progressed, the Indian diaspora is still carrying those old norms. So, you know, the elephant in the room is that that is, that is what the problem is and we need, to, we need to really change that. No, I think often the look into India doesn't exist anymore when they yeah. come back because I think India is changing so fast that the diaspora needs to catch up in some bits. Needs, yeah. needs, to, needs to really catch up. But uh, Navroop and the uh, CEO of the Digital Economist, I'm sorry I didn't give everyone's designations because I couldn't, there were so many of them. But Navroop, if you can come in on that, because in a way it's been great that women have joined the digital revolution. And in some ways it's actually been easier for them to access oppor opportunities they couldn't earlier. But recent studies have shown that both whether it's labor force participation or even the digital divide, it's impacted women much more after COVID. How do you work with something like that or with that challenge? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, I would say I am CEO and I have no problem making sure others realize that. Um, and I am also the next generation. So there's some hope. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I live in New York City, so have a similar, uh, I guess, diaspora perspective. I kind of see myself as a global citizen because um, I've lived in eight countries, 16 cities. So it's not just, uh, you know, India and sort of US story. Um, and I agree with everything what that was said so far, right? And for example, you talked about education being the passport of freedom, 100%, right? And it's interesting because um, in, in India, if, if I was just there, this would have been a completely different story or where my life would be and what I'll be doing. Um, and so, so there's that. Uh, so to, coming to your question, uh, Sonia, around the digital divide, around uh, technology, um, I think it is playing the role of being that leveling field, right? And, and we've seen that a lot of studies and research has been quoted on this panel here so far. Um, and I think when it comes to Indian women, it's, it's interesting because, you know, there is that uh, contradictions, right, in, in Indian culture um, where women are worshipped one hand, on the other hand, we are some of the worst, actually one of the worst countries in the world when it comes to women empowerment, right? I think it's just like number four, um, right? From from the bottom, like right after Afghanistan and Pakistan and what have you. Um, but it also has produced these extraordinary women who've, you know, uh, tackled extraordinary challenges and, and risen above them. So, you know, if you see, for example, in the United States, women, Indian women are doing very well, right? Because of education, because of that hero's journey that uh, they, they've been on and, and, yes. and you know, achieve things as a result of that and turn around and become social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, and not just, you know, inspire, uh, you know, the next generation, uh, but also tangibly change, uh, uh, change the game. Uh, it's interesting because for me, like when I see my friends who, um, can I just say white women? Uh, is everybody cool with that? Um, <laughs> Because uh, we come from a, a very, what I call, high patriarchy. Um, and um, it, so it's so much in our faces, it's very obvious when it happens. But when I'm in the US, I realize it's a lot more internalized. And it's like, oh, you don't, you don't realize that you know, you're, you're being a vessel, if you may, um, of, of, of uh, patriarchy. And this is this guy's ego that is being, you know what I mean, deployed here to do ABC. And it's just like, for me, it's clear as a day, right? But, uh, but I think that's where we're turning around. And actually, in the, in the West as well, if you may, mm -hmm. um, supporting initiatives. We work with the World Bank on gender, on public goods delivery, work with IBM on energy, uh, so on and so forth. So um, it, that can be opportunistically deployed anywhere in the world, just, just like you're in Switzerland here, um, to create change. So I think the, the service to the world goes beyond just India, right? No, absolutely, and I agree with you. I think the community of uh, women and women who are either from India or South Asian women is so strong, but I, I think the I mean, I would disagree slightly. I think Indian women are doing very well in India, and I think the pace of change is actually something which is much more rapid. We've really seen that accelerate a lot in the last decade. And uh, uh, Nita, I'd like to bring in your perspective on that, and uh, then Divya, but just on that uh, Indian women and how, in a sense, and uh, I know that many of the studies, uh, sorry, many of the studies that are quoted shows this gender gap decreasing, but the reality in India, the lived reality, there seems to be, in a sense, a vibrancy and urgency 
amongst Indian women, which I don't think ha is coming out or portrayed enough. Yeah, well, first of all, I don't think there is a monolithic thing called Indian women. Yes, exactly. You know, and I think Reshma's right about there are very paradoxical mm -hmm. aspects to thinking about the status of Indian women. If you say that to me, I'm going to say, is it informal? Is it formal? Is it rural? Is it urban? Is it somebody from a tribal community? Is it a well-educated woman in an urban environment? Those lived experiences are completely different, which is why I really struggle with some of these indexes and these benchmarking studies, because frankly, it is impossible to capture the nuances of these different lived experiences in an index which shows you know, India's number four. It's useful in some ways, you know, uh, to have these indices because it can spur public policy and action, particularly from smaller countries where they are very eager to show that they are really competing with, you know, the big guys, and they're often guys, mm -hmm. uh, on these issues. But I think, you know, for India, you have to be able to tell a very nuanced story. So life for a lot of women who don't have access to finance, who don't have access to health, who don't have access to clinics is nasty, brutish, and short. But life for women who have privilege, whether it's in terms of access to educational opportunities or other things, can be brilliant. And we see this. So we have just got to accept that there is nuance, that there is paradox. And then I will come back to this. We have got to share stories of what works. The story of women's participation at local government level in India is one that people do not know. The number of women who are in panchayats and the work that has been done to ensure representation, UN Women works on this issue, is enormous and the results are amazing. And if you look at representation, is it where it should be? No. But are there women sitting in that local panchayat who are saying, this is what I want to see done at the local community village level? Absolutely. If you look at certain industries, if you look across industries in India, finance, tech, media, there are women leaders everywhere. There, you're, you're sitting here. You are uh, an epitome of that. So there are women in extremely significant positions uh, and at a level that you do not necessarily see, even in the US. Look at the tech industry in the US. It's men. It's, it's male dominated. If you look at the finance industry in the US, at the upper echelons, it is still male dominated. Would you say that in India? No, you wouldn't. So I think there is nuance, and I think uh, you know there are stories that need to be told out there, but we just need to be really clear about whose story we are telling. Can I pick up on that? I just wanted to ma mention that you know representation is really important, and you know here I'm going to come back to the diaspora perspective. And one of the things I realized about three years ago was that. Um, there are many women, and here I'll say South Asian women, in women from you know India, Pakistan, and other South Asian countries, are actually in really incredible leadership positions in many different industries, and not always the traditional, you know, Indian professions, doctor, engineer, etc., and many other professions. And so we started actually a media platform in the United States. Uh, there is a uh, television show every Sunday on TV Asia, which is the largest television network in, um, in the United States, and a monthly magazine and a website that showcases the work that women of South Asian origin are doing, not just in the diaspora, but also back in India, because I completely agree with you. There is a lot to be said about progress that's being made, but it's invisible. It's not visible, and mainstream media is not covering it, so I think there are a bunch of us who got together and we said, let's do it. Let us cover those yeah. stories. And I think, you know, I think we all know if you cannot uh, see it, you cannot be it. And so to that um, extent, I think showing those, those, those stories is important for the next generation, for them to be also inspired into in leadership fact, positions. I just wanted to add, I don't know if you all saw that picture which Elon Musk had put on in Twitter and there were all these engineers surrounding him and they were all men. And I thought at, at that time that in India, the iconic picture was when we had launched, I think it was Mangalyaan, our mission, uh, to, our mission to Mars. And at that point, th all the engineers in the room were women, women in traditional South Indian saris, women who you would think would be, you know, your friend's mother would make you idlis. But these were the women who, at a quarter of the cost of NASA, 
put a mission on Mars. So I think those are the women that we celebrate when we talk about India. But I think also, I mean, of course, this is not all about uh, just uh, looking at positivity, but the challenges. And then it's also interesting because tech is such a new world industry, and that's really something where the field should have been at the beginning should have been leveled. Yet why is it that the tech world, uh, people like you, founders like you are so rare who are women? You know, women in leadership roles is something that it, it, it is a puzzling question, and I get asked literally every time, why are there so few of you? But I've also noticed that even though there's such few of us, maybe we're just 20% in a room, but we make 60% of the noise, right? <laughs> we give out 60% of the ideas, and I've seen this not just once or twice, so it's not about quantity, it's about quality. I really feel that the women who are on top today, the women who are driving change today, the women in leadership rules, are people, it's not enough but they are driving change, they are creating impact. So I'm a strong believer, I'm not a, I'm not a believer in tokenism, but I do believe that quota can get us somewhere, it can improve the numbers, but beyond that it has to be about merit, because I can see that merit today, right? So why it has been difficult, uh, so, and it shouldn't be, because what is tech doing? Tech is solving problems at scale, and when you're trying to solve a problem, problem at scale, unless you take in half uh, you know, the, 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 the ideas from half the community, you cannot impact the entire community. You need a multi-dimensional approach to both problem solving and solution creation. That's when you can crea create impact at scale. And I can speak for education and what education has done. Here there is very healthy diversity and we are segment leaders, we are fortunate to be segment leaders in ed tech and I still don't place myself in ed tech because we are beyond education and technology. We are education and without human, with human intervent intervention and technology. So we have 33% leadership uh, being women, 40% women across the board, and out of the 150 million students, 50% are girls. So I think education is one of those segments where you are seeing very good representation of women, maybe because it's such an inclusive subject. Right, and, and wh why are there so few women at top? I think it's because people are, are not looking for leaders within. So what worked for us differently, and I, and I think I should bring that in, is that we started our company 11 years ago, right? And with six founding team members, and uh, about 300 people over the next one year, out of the 300 people, 260 people are with us today. We pulled up our leaders from within. Now I think that's something companies don't really do honing up your leaders from within. And there are so many women who've gone on maternity breaks and come back. I believe they come back stronger than ever. And why do I say that? I say that as a mother. I have a two-year-old, I have a nine-year-old. A lot of people ask me, what have, why such a big age gap? I say the company was born in between. My third baby, the biggest one, the elephant in the room. Taking care of it is not easy, but I acknowledged. I, I lent on my support system, which I was fortunate to have. My parents, my in-laws, right? My husband's brother, the men in my family have played an equal role. And that's why I so confidently say that men can take charge and take care. I've seen that in action in my company, in my family. So I think we're slowly driving towards that. And, uh, and you know, Sonia, I met so many people today. You know, my happiest moment was when I met this little girl. She's Rupa's daughter, and she's my student. Oh, really? You know? And uh, can you just stand up so that people can see you? <laughs> this, this for me is impact. This for me is scale. Right? You can meet anybody in the world. But, and, and I started as a teacher. For me, my happiest moment was today was when I met my student. <laughs> So well, we are, it's been a fascinating session. We're nearly out of time, so I just like to end with everybody perhaps giving what their one action point would be to make to actually take that moonshot. Uh, Reshma, what, why don't you go? Yeah, you know, so me, I, I, I said it in my uh, previous conversation. Uh, it's really about social norms. And for me, if I have to take action, and this is why I don't necessarily rely on uh, organizations or on governments or on funding, because you know, to change your mindset, what do you need? You need to think differently, that's it. And as women, and you know, Anita said that when, when she was talking about the norms, I don't think it's just men who put expectations on women. Women put expectations on women. You know, as much as I love my mother, my mother had the expectation that I get married at 23 and make babies at 24. <laughs> So women put expectations, and for me, you know, if you have to change the social norms, and if you, every one of us, want to take action, change your mindset. Look at women differently. And as Divya rightly said, and I, this is something I'm definitely going to use going forward, you know, it's not only that we can take care, we do take care, we can also be in charge, and we can take charge. So change that mindset. 
uh, Seema and Navroop, then we'll come back to you. Sure. Um, I would say be the change you want to see in the world. I, I agree with everything that was said so far. Partly, it's a, it's a, there's a feedback loop, right? You, t you, you take an action, maybe a bold action, you see the impact, and you grow from there. It's an upward moving uh, cyclical journey. And, uh, and before you know, they're calling you a leader, right? And uh, at least that's my experience. So, so you'll get there. So every small step, uh, step in action, I think that counts. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I also heard something that uh, Reshma Saljani, who is the CEO of Girls Who Code, said to me, and it was just eye-opening for me. And as she put together the Marshalls uh, Act for moms, what she said, her big um, quote there was, stop trying to fix the woman, fix the system. Uh, so for me, it'll be just one line. You educate a woman, you educate a generation. And that's what my mission is, simple, right? I want to make sure that we, when you can't take uh, the child to the school, you take the school to the child, or you bring learning to the child, because I believe that what, that's what will create, uh, that's the difference, right? Education is all the difference. And of course, with health and everything, but education can be the biggest differentiator. I would say we have to rethink power. Who owns power? Who deploys power? Right now, I have to say, most power is still exercised by men. So we need men as allies. This is not a woman's journey alone. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that, actually? Sure. It's, it's a fascinating topic. I'm sorry for grabbing this again here. I love what you said. And uh, I, I did political science minor. I remember this quote like from my impressionable age, which is, power is what you exercise. Power is intangible, right? Uh, it is only known, it only becomes apparent when you exercise it. So that means we as women need to exert more influence and power in order to, to get more power. So. Absolutely. And just to sum up, I think the most important thing that we look at when we talk about women leadership or women taking their rightful place, taking that moonshot, is self-belief. Because I think that the thing is that I've seen that even after, if you get a big promotion, you may get it. But for you yourself to believe that, I am that leader. I am the person who can take the decisions. I'm the one in charge. That's the journey I think each of us to have to make, because only if we dream it can we do it. And I hope all of us have that dream for us, for our daughters, for our sons, and uh, for humanity. So thank you all for being part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the great panel. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Uh, yes. yes? Thank you.